Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Loma Linda University. We especially want to welcome our visitors that are with us today and hope that you will gain a rich blessing from our worship. We want to welcome our regular members and glad that you're always here and supporting us and being so regular. And those that are viewing on LLBN and on the internet through our church website, LLUC.org, we consider you all a part of our church family. And we want to welcome Heralds of Hope today under the direction of Gerald Wareham. It's nice to have them providing our worship music today. Pastor Roy Ice is going to be bringing our message today, the second in our series on holy habits that helps us to develop as disciples of Jesus in our walk with him. And his title is High Repetitions. Pastor Randy will be back with us next week to continue this series. And with so many tragedies and difficult things going on in the world with hurricanes and floods and fires and earthquakes and threats of war. It's really a troubling time. But David could write in Psalm 59 at a time when King Saul was plotting to kill him that but I will sing of your strength in the morning. I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. You are my strength. I will sing praise to you. You, God, are my fortress, my God, on whom I can rely. It's so good that at a time like this, we can know that God is our fortress and strength. Again, welcome to worship.
prayer. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you that we can gather here in freedom to praise your name. You are our almighty king, Lord. Lord, enter into this place and may we sense your presence. Come into our hearts and Lord, may we sense your presence. Draw us into prayer, into Bible study. Draw us into holy habits that bring us near to each other and to you. Lord, this week has been particularly difficult for our brothers and sisters in Florida and the Deep South. Dear Lord, the news continues to come out that's so difficult. It could have been worse, Lord, and we thank you for those blessings, but we ask, Lord, that you will be with those who have suffered great uh, loss. We ask that you will uh, come into their hearts and may they be uh, warmed by your spirit and helped by fellow Christians. Lord, I ask that you will be with us as we consider our place in this community. May we be the source of light, love, and forgiveness and energy for the Loma Linda University Church. Lord, may the children and the youth of this church see how we live our lives out for Jesus Christ. May they choose to follow in our footsteps and to live in the fear of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for the blessings we have in this church. We look forward to our new building, Lord, with such good news. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the Bible study and the small groups that are happening here. May we be drawn closer together and closer to you because of them. Lord, we ask that you'll be with our pastor this morning who breaks the, the word to us. May we be ever receptive in our hearts. Bless us this day, dear Lord, and we ask humbly that you would give us a Sabbath day's blessing, that we might be near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. We are grateful for your kids. As your child goes through different stages here at our church, we are intentional about the worship experience that they have and their spiritual journey from infancy all the way to adulthood. Together, we strive to make a difference in the lives of our children at Loma Linda University Church. I am Shauna Campbell, and I am the children's pastor. I get to oversee all our young kids from birth all the way to fourth grade, and I love my job. If you ever want to see what we do every Sabbath, I invite you to walk down our halls and come stick your nose into the different Sabbath school rooms. Our goal is that each Sabbath school room has so many fun stories, Bible stories and activities and singing that children want to come and learn about Jesus. They want to know more about him. However, children's ministries is not just about the child. It's about the family as well. We try and include parents and get them involved in every facet of the ministry. We try and get them involved in Sabbath school, but we also have different events planned for our families to bring them to our church community. For example, one of the things we have planned is our animal program coming up in just a few weeks. 
We also have a fall picnic at Oak Glen that hopefully we will bring the whole family as well as the children to come play and fellowship and to get to know one another. And so my desire for each child who comes to our church, that they understand that they are the, a bigger part of the church community. They are part of everything that we do here. We want them to know that they are a big part of every single aspect of our church life. And we want them to know about Jesus. We want them to learn about his love. And so this morning, I just want to thank you. Thank you for your continued financial support, and thank you for your prayers in my ministry. It is a complete privilege to be able to work with the children of our church. And as they start reaching preteens, I pass the baton on to Doug, who has a fabulous program for his children. My name is, my name is Pastor Doug Mace. There we go. And it is a pleasure to be a part of the middle school ministries here. Middle school ministries uh, includes grades 5, 6, 7, and 8. And while I oversee a parent-run program in 5 and 6, we introduce to these kids a youth, uh, youth group model in junior high. Junior high is the age of accountability. This is where they make decisions to either leave the church studies have shown, or stay in the church. And we make sure that they have something to stay for. We talk about baptism a lot. We have Bible studies coming up in just a couple weeks to prepare them for Bible study. These are 11 and 12 year olds. We want them to make decisions for Jesus that lives a whole lifetime. And then when they make a decision for Jesus, they get baptized, their friends see what they're doing, and they bear witness to a loving God that draws them into a lifestyle, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then we, the key to our junior high youth group is leadership, and you see some pictures there. Leadership are kids who commit in a high fashion, high commitment to be a leader of this church and learn how to be contributors, not consumers. Say that with me, contributors, not consumers. Too often, especially in this community, Kids come and they learn from their parents how to choose. They pick and choose what they want that Sabbath morning. We want them to make commitments to this church. We want them to learn how to be contributors, to bring their spirit of goodwill, their spirit of receptivity to the Holy Spirit, and to bring their gifts. And that's what leadership is for. Last night I was with 40, count them, 40 11 and 12-year-olds. If they had banded together, they could have taken me. I was actually very scared, don't tell them that, but I was scared. There was more, more kids than we had adults, and these are kids who want to be leaders. You'll see them out on Friday nights. We have dinner, we study, and then we go out and play around on the North Lawn. And uh, I get very excited about kids who choose to open their hearts to the Lord. Friends, you have been so supportive, and we're so thankful for your support in the ministry. This is an intentional ministry not by default, but by design. And when they're done with eighth grade, they graduate, and we pass the baton to our new youth pastor. And so now, as they enter into high school, many of you guys can remember some of those beautiful memories that you shared in ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And so this group is called the Region. And so you might be saying, well, what is Region? Region comes from the word regenerated. And it was taken from Romans 12 to where Paul tells us, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, regenerated in Christ. We believe God has the ability and power to regenerate their life. And so truly with this, our vision is this. It's simply this, to be a home where friends become family and together, growing together, in our faith. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, how do you guys do this? Well, one of the things we love to do is we want to create an intentional, safe place, a place where they can feel that they are loved and accepted, a safe place where they can belong before they believe, 
a place where they can ask questions and dialogue and we can talk about each other's faith. And so I'm excited that right now our series is called Together and we have a little symbolic representation, like a little emoji, like, like Pastor Doug, that's right. I'm holding this on me right now. But uh, together, we believe that life was meant to be lived together. And we thought, talk about a movement. This Christian movement, this seven-day Adventist movement was built on young people that were all in together. So we truly want to build that. We want to not just be focused on ourselves. We want to be focused on our community. We have many projects that we're working alongside in terms of focusing our, not on ourselves, but in others. And so we're excited about this. And most of all, one of the things that we want to do is deepening in our faith. Why are we Adventists? What is our beliefs? Where do we come from? And we're going to be sharing that in our next series called the next two series. We have faith, and the next one is why Adventism. So we're excited. We are excited about what God is doing. But most of all, we want to invite you. If you're a high school parent, I want to invite you October 14. Please put this on your calendars. October 14. We want to invite you to our fellowship hall where we'll be talking about plans for this next year. We want to include all of you guys. We want to live life together. And we truly believe it starts at home as we continually seek the presence of God. So we thank you so much for your continued support. We thank you because we're a part of this body of growing disciples. And our goal is to be this, an inspiration to this next generation. God bless you and thank you so much. We're so excited that Jonathan Norsorio is here. He's new and he's bringing a lot of energy, you can tell, to our, our group. Friends, if a child comes to University Church, we know that between the children, the junior high, and the youth department, and the young adult department, they will encounter the Lord. Thank you so much for your support.
In a few moments, we will look at the holy habits of reading the Bible and praying with a degree of high repetitions to see how this might help us grow the spiritual results we desire. Join us as we read the following quotes. Satan will always find you something to do when you ought to be occupied about regular prayerful Bible study if it is only arranging a window blind. Hudson Taylor Bible study without Bible experience is pointless. Knowing Psalm 23 is different from knowing the shepherd. Kingsley Opuwari Manuel. It struck me hard that when I read and studied the Bible, I started with my own preconceived notions, prejudices, and ideas of truth. I wasn't really looking for truth. I was looking for God's confirmation of mine. Van Harden. The more you continue to read scripture, the more you begin to think as he thinks and act as he acts. And that's how, over time, you gain the wisdom of the ages. Wayne Cordero. Good afternoon. Our scripture reading today is from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning to your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God.
I can say with fairly good certainty that there's something that all of us hate in common. Exercise. We want to exercise. We want to be fit. We want to be strong. We want to have well-defined muscles. We want people to look at us and say, wow, you look great. But we hate exercise. We have a lot of good reasons to not exercise and some fairly good excuses. Some of us have the excuse of we work so hard in all the other areas of our life that by the time we have the moment to exercise, we're exhausted. How am I supposed to expend energy I don't have? One man was overheard uh, in the gym talking to his trainer, and he says, what's, what's that machine for? And the trainer said, well, that's just a bench. And he says, oh, I know how to use the bench. And he sat down. <laughs> Another excuse we have is that gym memberships cost money. I love Rita Rudner's uh, comment when she talks about gyms. She says that uh, the word aerobics was created when a bunch of trainers got together and said, look, we can't charge people 10 bucks per person and call it jumping up and down. <laughs> gyms cost money. Another reason why people don't like uh, exercise is, uh, well, you don't really get the results you're looking for in the time that you want them. In fact, Many people go to the gym day after day, month after month, and they look in the mirror and they see the same person. One man was overheard talking to his friend. He says, you know, I've gone to the gym for the last five months, six days a week, and I'm still 250 pounds. His friend says, well, what do you do at the gym? He says, I deliver mail. I'm the mailman. The fact is you can go to the gym on a regular basis, but unless you're doing something different, unless you're doing what the people do to get fit, you will not get fit. The same is true about your spiritual flab. You will never become spiritually fit unless when you show up to the spiritual gym, you do what the spiritually fit people do. I love how our scripture reading for today delineates what you need to do. And so if you will, open your Bibles back up to Proverbs chapter 2, and we're going to take a look at the first two verses of our Bible reading, verses 1 and 2, to start out. He says, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, if you will store up, if you will store up, the knowledge of God. I love uh, watching the game show Jeopardy. I don't get to watch it very often. I don't watch much TV at all, but I, I love when I can watch the trivia game Jeopardy. I especially love it when one of the categories is a Bible category. I never feel better and more smart about myself than when there's a Bible category. Can I hear an amen? Perhaps you've been there. You, you see the Bible category and you're like, how could you not know this? I'll never forget the episode I was watching. And Alex Trebek, he, he talks about the very last, the right side category on the board. And the title is Bible Names. The B has quotations around it. And Alex explains these Bible names begin with the letter B. As the game goes on, someone picks Bible names for 200, Alex. And he reads the answer. She was, uh, she, uh, he was the second husband of Ruth. All of a sudden, the genius clicks the clicker. And Alex says, yes. He says, who was Moses? <laughs> Moses? Is there, is there a silent B in Moses I've never seen? <laughs> Alex says, no, I'm sorry, you're incorrect. The second person hits the clicker. He says, yes. Who is Noah? Seriously. I never felt better about myself than that moment watching the Jeopardy show. It's amazing that these people, and, and they're, these are geniuses. I mean, these people under pressure know the, the most minute details about current and past events. They know the characters of literature that you don't even know the title to that book. They know Shakespeare backwards and forwards, but ask them about the Bible. They have not stored up 
that knowledge. The best-selling book of all time, and they have not stored up the knowledge of God. It goes on in verse 3 to say, Indeed, if... Uh, this is our second if. There's actually three ifs in this passage, which means there are conditions. If you do this, then you'll get that. First of all, it said, if you'll accept the words and store them up, turn your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. The second if, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding. This is not a private experience. This is a very public experience. You are insisting. You are intent. You are publicly crying out, I want to know God, regardless of whether it's embarrassing or not. You are crying out with great intention. You want to know the very character of God. Now, I'm going to share something about myself that might surprise many of you. Over the years, I cannot count how many times people have brought me a Starbucks coffee. It's very kind of them, very generous of them. Starbucks coffee is expensive. I am delighted that they even thought of me of all, at all and, and that they parted with their cash to bring me a Starbucks coffee. There's just one minor problem. I don't like coffee. No, I don't. I don't like it black. I don't like it with cream. I, I, I don't like it if it's uh, pumpkin spiced or pepperminted or mocha. I don't like it if it's blonde, medium, or dark roast. I don't like it if it's cappuccino, frappuccino, macchiato, or espresso. I don't like coffee. I don't care if it's from Sumatra or Pike's Place. I don't like the taste of coffee. That might come as a surprise to some of you who are like, this guy's 47 years old, he's got so much energy, he's got to be on something. <laughs> well, I'm not on coffee. I just don't like the taste. Some of you might be saying, well, Starbucks has tea too. Oh, I'm sorry to say, I don't like tea. I don't like it hot. I don't like it iced. I don't like it plain, sweetened, tropical, or green. I do not like tea. And I know what some of you, my friends in the South, are saying, but Pastor Rice, you haven't had my son tea. To which I reply, yes, I have. And you obviously don't have my taste buds. Because if you want to drink crumpled up dried leaves that have been soaked in water until it looks like rust, help yourself. <laughs> I just don't like it. So imagine over the years, all these kind people coming to me, bringing me a beverage, thinking, wow, this will just totally make his day. Well, in many ways, it does make my day. It it caffeinates my relationship with them. It, it warms my heart. It sweetens my thoughts about them, but I don't drink it. I accept the gift. I never refuse the gift. And some of you are thinking, oh, my word, I gave him a Starbucks. <laughs> I accept the gift not because I want to drink the beverage. I accept it because I accept not the grounds of coffee, but I accept the grounds of Christian generosity that you are sending my way. I don't want to drink it. I don't like it. But I look at you and I say, what a kind, thoughtful person you are. And then when you leave, I take it to one of my caffeine-addicted friends and give it to them. And they think, what a kind, generous person <laughs> Pastor Ice is. It's okay to re-gift Starbucks, I understand. Why do most people think I like Starbucks? I can only assume that they do what we do about everything. We look at the general populace. We say, what do people like? Well, I like Starbucks, and we're in Loma Linda, and you can say Starbucks in an Adventist church and still not be fired, so I guess... He might like Starbucks. I see other people drinking Starbucks. In fact, as I, as I pull the proclivity of the community and I think this is something that they like, well, obviously, he's got to be part of the majority. They, everyone loves Starbucks. I see a few of you shaking your head no. <laughs> and so you assume, well, if most people like it, he's like most people, and you make an assumption based on your opinion and the common opinion of the social 
cultural construct in which you live. And you apply that to me. It doesn't offend me. It just doesn't bless my life in the way that you would think it, that it would bless. In that same way, we as a community of faith, as we try to give our best gifts to God, give Him the best thing that we can think of, we use our opinion, we poll the crowd, what would God want? What would God allow? And we spend all of our mental energy trying to say, what does the community believe? And we offer God our best, and I'm sure he looks down and says, oh, that's so sweet, but I don't drink that. That's so kind of you. That warms my heart. But I don't like that. I think kind thoughts of you, but you're off base. We're in danger of offering to God our best and God saying, that's not even on my list. That's not even part of my wish list. If we do not read the word and know who God is and understand his consistent characters, we are in danger of offering to God things he doesn't even want. I think of the story that happened right over here in the Getty Museum not too long ago. I read of it first in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. It's one of the opening stories where he, he talks about this little statue, very rare statue, almost 3,000 years old. The paperwork was there. It was checking out worth millions of dollars. They subjected the paperwork and the, and the artifact to the committees, and the committees looked and said, yes, everything checks out. This is real. This is one of the most amazing finds that we've had in our lifetime. This is incredible. But you know what they say about committees. I love the, the poster that's for sale. It has a beautiful picture of a, of a boardroom table and has a black border, has the white words capitalized there, committee. And in smaller letters underneath it, it says, where none of us are as dumb as all of us. <laughs> you can subject this to a committee. And what Malcolm Gladwell proposes in his book, Blink, is that those who have less experience, who are part of study groups, can look at all the details, all the evidence, and come up with an incorrect solution. But those who have experience, he goes on to tell about a couple of individuals who stopped by the Getty on their way to different places, and, and they got to see the statue before it was purchased. One individual He's a curator at, at a museum, and he uh, has a journal that he writes down the first word that, he, that comes to his mind the first time he sees a piece. Immediately, he sees the piece, and he says, it's a fake. Because the word that came to mind was fresh. And you can't have fresh and artifact in the same sentence. So he intuitively knew. How did he intuitively know? Because he had spent his life studying authentic artifacts. He could tell within a split second truth from falsehood. It's interesting to note that it wasn't several months later, after they had paid millions of dollars for this artifact, that when they began to dig a little deeper, that they found out that the papers were fraudulent. The names, the bank account numbers, the addresses were, were made up. Those that knew the originals, those that had spent time, could easily spot truth from error. That's why our Bible study needs to be regular, habitual, and with high repetition. That's the only way you get the big picture of God. That's the only way when someone comes to you with new teaching, new doctrine, something exciting. It's the only way that you can determine whether this guy is onto something or off his rocker. It's the only way. To me, it's a, a little humorous when someone comes to me and says, you know, pastor, I actually receive more of a spiritual blessing when I'm out in nature than when I come to church or to a Bible study group. 
I would agree with them, and I empathize in some degree with them, that there are some churches and there are some study groups that are fairly anemic. The power of God is not evident, and it's not all that exciting and motivating. But I also ask them a question. Where do you go in nature? I kind of chuckle here because, although I know I'm going to hear about it in emails, there's not a lot of nature around here to go to, unless you're going to the beach or the golf course. And if you're going to the beach and the golf course, chances are you're not taking your Bible. If you are going in nature, are you taking God's Word with you and someone to study it with? Or is your desire to get out in nature to discover yourself? Because the more you discover yourself, the farther away you get from God and the character of God. The text goes on in verses 4 and 5. We've had intensity up to this moment. We know we're supposed to do it with regularity. But verses 4 and 5 take it to the next level. Because it says, And if you look for it as for silver, and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. A student went off to Duke University his freshman year. His parents sent him off with a prayer, a blessing, and a brand new Bible. They said, please, son, read your Bible every day. He said, I will. I will, Mom and Dad. And he went off to school. Short time later, he wrote home and said, Mom and Dad, I need some money. They replied with a letter and said, read, and they gave him a Bible verse. He replied, I'm reading the Bible, and I read it, but I still need money. They replied back, we understand. Why don't you read this verse? And this went on and on until the first semester break. When the son came home, and they were having a a bit of a discussion about his money troubles, and his parents say, we know you have not been reading your Bible. He said, how can you tell? They said, every place that we sent you a text reference has hidden either a $10 or a $20 bill. And had you gone to those places in the Bible, you would have found the treasure hidden within. (laughs) Unless you're willing to dig deep, you'll never find the treasure. I think back to my senior year of college. I had a Bible that, at that time, uh, was my toolbox. I had written notes in it from my Greek and Hebrew classes. I had notes from my other Bible and theological courses. It was... It was precious to me. One weekend, we drove from Texas up to Colorado to do a weekend program, and we came back, and as I was unpacking, I couldn't find my Bible. I searched throughout my whole room. I cannot find my Bible. I search again and again. I look look everywhere. And then I went to the driver of the car, and I said, hey, I think I left my Bible in your car. Can, Can you look for me? He said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll look. The next day, I saw him. I said, did did you find the Bible? No, no. Did you? Yeah, I looked. Can you look again? Perhaps it's under a seat. I don't know. Just can you look again? Yeah, sure. I'll look again. He looked again. Saw him the next day. No, I didn't find it. It was three months later. I'm standing in a a parking lot talking to some of my friends, and the driver of the car is there, and he, he pops his trunk and starts going through mounds of junk he had in the back looking for something. And it was in that moment that I looked, and I just barely saw a small corner of the spine of my Bible, but I recognized it instantly, and I lunged toward the car, and I tore the stuff off of the top of it, and I pulled it out, and I hugged it. I felt like the woman who had swept for the coin in her house. I found it. What was lost was now found. Yet you guys don't understand. Had I had $10,000 at that time, there would have been posters all over campus. $10,000 reward. It was precious to me. It had notes I couldn't remember. Things I needed as a young pastor that, 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 that were not ingrained in my memory yet. It was precious. I turned to the driver and I said, I thought you said you looked for it. He said, oh, I did. There's a difference when you know it's treasure and when you don't treasure it. How intently do you search? How deep do you look for the treasure? Now, I did a lot of research and I decided not to share it with you because I figure you already know the number of people sitting around you and people who call themselves Christians who do not spend regular time in God's Word. 
The number's not good. It's a, definitely a failing grade. But I want to share a different figure with you today, one that might come a little bit closer to home. As we've looked at the number of worshipers here in this congregation, and we're thankful for every single one of you. We love you dearly. We're so glad that you come to worship God in this sanctuary. But as we've done the math and seen how many of our worshipers are also involved in either an adult Sabbath school class or a midweek Bible study, it is a very low failing grade. We figure there are about two-thirds of our worshipers that are not involved in regular study with a small group. Can I encourage you this week? I want you to do something. I want you to look at your bulletin. I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor, I've been looking at this bulletin the whole time you've been talking. Um, The rest of you look at your bulletin too. And open up to the section where it says adult Sabbath school classes. There's a list there of small group Bible studies that will help you to get to know the character of God. Just like many of you would not know that I don't like coffee or tea had we not been in this situation. And the only people that would know are people that have spent one-on-one time with me or in a smaller group setting. The only way you can know what God wants and what God doesn't want is by spending time personally, one-on-one, in a small group, and corporately in worship. Can I encourage you this week, if you are not currently seeking out a Bible study group, will you pray about it and ask God to highlight for you on this list or to highlight in your heart the passion to start your own group? And whether that's throughout the week or on Sabbath morning, that God will completely come into your heart and give you the motivation to either attend or lead a Bible study group to change your life and the lives of the people around you. I love the story that comes from 1991, August 20 and 21, the wee hours of August 21. It happened in Moscow, and Father Alexander Borisov was walking in his black and gold vestments amongst the gathering tanks and soldiers. Tension was at an all-time high as the country tried to figure out, is it going to be able to stand or fall? A very tense, stressful time. And Alexander Borisov walked with a stack of Bibles in his hand, not expecting to come home alive that night, because the very act of handing out the Bibles was life-threatening. As he walked amongst the soldiers and had conversations with anyone he could. He handed out the Bibles. And, and to the troops that wouldn't talk to him and, and were ignoring him, he'd climb up in, onto the tanks and throw New Testaments down the hatch into the tank. He was determined that the people would come into contact with God's Word. In the wee hours of the morning, August 21, 1991, They had run out of the small New Testaments, and all they had left were children Bibles. One was handed to a Russian soldier who who wanted to read it, but he was afraid that his superiors would punish him for having possession of it. And so looking at his situation, he realized he did have a pocket, a pocket that the Bible would fit perfectly in. And so he emptied out the ammunition pocket, and filled it with the Bible. My question for you today is, what's closest to your heart? What's in your heart's pocket? Is it a bunch of bullet points? Is it a bunch of ammo? Or is it the Word of God? God wants to change your life. He wants you to know who He is. He wants you to know His preferences and And what you need to do to be the greatest influence in the world that you live. What's closest to your heart? Bullets or the Bible? Let's pray. God, I pray today that you'll help us to truly seek after you as treasure and to truly make use of the wealth that we have, the the ability, the accessibility of your scripture And I pray, Lord, that your spirit will do what only your spirit can do and change our cravings.
Help us to get excited and, and to not only find time to read about you, to learn about you through your word and through prayer, but Lord, that you will just truly come alive in us and through us so that it will be contagious to our loved ones around. And we pray this in your precious name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, everybody. Yes, I know, it's been quite a week and longer. And our purpose in being here is to let you know that we wish everybody the very, very best. And I've got pictures of several people and others I'm going to greet as warmly as possible. So right at the top of my list, Don and Elaine Skortz, 
are marking their 67th wedding anniversary, they are still pastoring right now at the Homeland Church right here in Southeastern California Conference. Warmest congratulations to you, Dan, and to you, Sister Elaine. Evelyn Ray Nielsen, bless your heart. Always glad to see you and be in touch with you. And now to wish you, Evelyn, a very happy birthday there with that special man, Lee, in your life. We wish you, Evelyn, the very, very best. Cynthia King Holstein lives right here in the Loma Linda area, but I don't have a picture, but I wish you the very best for your birthday nonetheless, Cynthia. Marion Nelson, up in Roseville, California, marking a 90th birthday. Happy birthday to you, Marion. Look at her, Eva Gay Ruado in Miami. I haven't been able to learn just what happened, but Eva Gay, I wish you a very happy birthday nonetheless. Yvonne Washington, out in Newbury Park, California. Hello, Yvonne. Happy birthday to you. And next comes my dear friend and classmate, Ivan Blazin. Hello, Ivan. Happy birthday to you, brother. And Ricky Marsa, right here, part of the Loma Linda University Church. Hello, Ricky. Happy birthday to you. And look at this lady. Yes, you know her. Quite a classy lady, wouldn't you agree? And I am so blessed to get to call Betsy Matthews my darling wife. Happy birthday, dear. Another cool lady born the same day, Judy Gimble. Hello, Judy. I don't know if you're in Calgary or back here in Loma Linda, wherever. I want to wish you the very best and greet you and dear Howard. Francis Brown, another September 18 lady. Hello, Francis, over in West Virginia. Happy birthday to you. Jim Brown. Tempe, Arizona. Hello, Brother Jim. Always glad to be where you are, and I wish you a very, very happy birthday and warm greetings to Cindy as well. Hello, Amy Obata. Right here, Loma Linda, at the Loma Linda Villa Care Center. How about a birthday? Happy birthday to you, Amy. Betty Park at the Villa. Hello, Betty. Happy birthday to you and to Bob Boast who is also at the villa. Happy birthday, Bob. Andrew Abraham, down at Brookdale, right here in Loma Linda. I wish you the very best too, Abraham, or Andrew rather. Hey, you go by both names, don't you? And Tim Hickman, hello, brother Timothy. Happy birthday, brother. Warmest best to you. Evelyn Laudenslager, what a happy note to realize you're having another birthday, and I wish you the very, very best. What a beautiful family you have, Evelyn. And Beth Peterson in Glendale, California. Hello, Beth. Happy birthday to you, dear. And finally, Faye Chilson, Green Bay, Wisconsin. So glad you're in touch with us here at Loma Linda, and we wish you a very happy birthday, Faye Chilson. Warmest best to all, thank you for being a part of this Loma Linda family.